But we're excited about that. And, uh, and uh, hi, guys. Oh, little babies. Love it. Love it. Um, we're glad you're here. And listen, if you just get it on your calendar, mark it in pen. Um, make sure you're here next Sunday night at 6 o'clock. It's going to be a great time for the Upper Room Experience. Looking forward to that. Um, listen, we're going to start with prayer. And uh, I know a number of you maybe know the Dickinson family. And uh, their older son passed away this last weekend. I was had the opportunity to minister to their family, and they're going through some tough times. And uh, I know that uh, some of you know them, and just be in prayer for them. I know they'd appreciate that. And maybe you got some things in your life. Maybe there's some things going on that uh, that you're just you're just it's a heavy bear, heavy burden to bear. And um, so we're gonna pray. And uh, why don't you open with a word, let's open with a word of prayer, and uh, if you'd bow with me, you can put your hands up in front of you, just saying, God, here is, here's all this stuff that I'm dealing with, or, or even just these other families that are going through, and, and uh, let's just pray uh, for, for all these things that are going on, and invite Jesus into this moment. God, thank you so much for this opportunity that we could be here, and, and to worship you, and to exalt you. We're so grateful that we get to be a part of this family, and just celebrate your name, and lift you high, and uh, we're so grateful for that. Um, Lord, we are, are, are so thankful that the songs that we sang today, just a reminder again of that you're our Savior, that you live, and that, that you're our lighthouse, and that you're the river that satisfies our soul, and, and that we just lay down our lives for you. And so all these, God, all these words are just reminders again of how desperately we need you. And Lord, we just come before you. We got some things that are on our hearts and our minds that we want to lay before you and ask that you would do what only you can do. And uh, like we think of, of uh, the, um, uh, the Dickinson family and just pray for just peace and comfort for them. And, and uh, I know this has been a long weekend and I know it's going to be a long week. And Lord, I just, we just pray as uh, in our, a family in our own community, uh, we just pray your peace and comfort to rest upon them. And Lord, we just pray that uh, for those others in this room that have stuff going on in their lives and maybe we don't even know about, God, there's things going on in their marriage or their kids or their health or their job, maybe they're worried about some things. God, we come before you and we lay those at your feet knowing that, that there's, we need you to do what only you can do and that, God, you're, you're the one that can do the miraculous and we're asking you to do that in our lives. God, we are, are, are know that we could call upon you, and, and, and God, we're just so grateful that, um, that, that you are present with us here today, and that, that God, um, we pray that you would just speak to us. Holy Spirit, we invite you in this moment um, uh, to speak and whisper into our hearts and our minds, and, and just the value of church family, the value of being a part of what you're doing here every weekend, and uh, we'll be careful to give you all the glory. We love you, um, we invite you into this moment, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Well, we're in this series. I love it. And again, I want to remind you again just how important the church family is, and uh, that it can be, the church family can be an, an exceptional part of your life, and, 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 and just making sure that you're here. And I love what the writer of Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. He says, let us not give, it up, uh, let's not give up meeting together. Um, as some are in the habit of doing. In other words, what he's saying is, listen, uh, make this thing a priority in your life. Make the gathering of the saints, the gathering of followers of Jesus, um, make it a priority in your lives. Um, I don't know about you, but sometimes we like to say to one another, and I've, I'm guilty as charged, all right? I, I've done this before, but have you ever said, hey, listen, we ought to get together sometime? Have you ever said that before? And it's like, you know, you know what you're saying there. You're like, listen, you're really an important person. I love you. I value you. You're just not that important to get on my calendar, right? No, not that crass. But the thing is, it's like we're not able to go to that next step and get you on our calendar and say, listen, let's do this. Uh, not only, it's like we have good intentions, but listen, good intentions are one thing. It's like we need to take some steps and make those things happen. It's like get it on the calendar. And so when it comes to the church, listen, what you need to consider is making sure that you get it on your calendar and not just in pencil, but what? In ink, right? Now some of you are like, what's a calendar? I got a, the only phone is all I got. Well, okay, then start typing it in there. Every Sunday, I'm there, right? Unless I'm sick or I'm, I'm gone somewhere. Um, I'm going to make sure that this family is a priority of my life. Uh, because there are things that, why, G, why he says that, hey listen, some are in the habit of, of not doing that, of not making this a priority, and, and we want it to be a priority in our lives, and I get that. Um, when you understand the value of the church, you understand how much it's important to put it in ink, and so get it in what? Get it in ink, right? And then he says, hey listen, but let us encourage one another all the more as you see the day approaching. The day approaching is, is when Jesus comes back, and we're looking forward to that day, Amen. 
Uh, we're looking forward to that day when Jesus plays peekaboo. Poo, I'm here. And it's like, whoa, we're ready to go. And uh, I, I, long, I was thinking about this last week. I mean, wouldn't it be great if like, like the worship band was up here playing and then all of a sudden the sky opens up and, and he plays peekaboo and he, and he says, come on up guys. And we're like, yeah, that's awesome. And uh, okay, I'm the only one excited, I guess, about that. And, uh, but I'm looking forward to that day. And uh, I can't wait. The, the other night, my, my son Luke and I were uh, looking out up at the nighttime sky, and I saw this, this sat- uh, satellite go by and knew it wasn't a plane, knew it was a satellite. And I remember thinking, man, I can't wait where every eye is going to see him. And they're going to be like, there he is. There he is. And he's going to say, come on home. Let's go home. So I can't wait for that day. And see, we're meant to, the church family is meant to be that priority in your life. And that's what we need to make sure um, that we're doing. And uh, some of you are like, listen, I'm sorry, I missed a couple. It's okay. I'm not trying to jump all over you. What I'm just trying to say is make sure that you get it a part of your calendar. Get it a part of your life because it's going to benefit your life. And the reason why we do things is because it benefits us. We've talked about this. Um, We get guidance for life. We get guidance from God's word, guidance from each other that have tested God. God's word and found it to be true. We get to be on a team with a killer mission. And now killer, for some of you, it's good. That's a good word, okay? Um, uh, it's, it's like an amazing mission. Uh, that's what we get to be a part of. And uh, see, this is, there's so many benefits about being a part of a church family. And you miss out on some things when you miss it. And uh, you don't make it a habit of being here. And uh, listen, one other benefit that we're going to talk about this morning is um, you get the loving support of family and friends, Okay? You know, when you go through some, some trying times, it seems like when you're going through good times, you don't notice it as much, right? It's like when, 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 uh, when, when the harvest is plentiful, you know, you don't really even think much about it. But when it's few, it's all of a sudden we start thinking. We start paying attention. And you'll notice that in trying times, it's when you realize that you need the intangible presence of God to become tangible. And that's what the church is meant to be. The church is meant to be that tangible presence of God in our lives. And you're going to know it when you go through something, it's like you need that presence and you need God's presence in your life. And God is saying, listen, go to church, go to church. If there's anything that you can invest in, anything that you can be a part of, it's going to be the church. Get into the church. And, and I love this. That's why he's, this, the church is really important. The church family is really important. In Matthew 16, verse 18, look at it with me. This is what Jesus says to Peter. He says, hey, who do, you say, what do you say, who do you say that I am? Peter's saying, you're the Messiah and all this kind of stuff. And then Jesus says, I tell you that you are Peter. And on this rock, I'll build my what? I'll build my church. That's people. I'm going to build my church. And get this. And the gates of hell will not what? Will not overcome it. I mean, you think about it. If there's anything ever on the face of planet, history, uh, in the past, present, or future, if there's anything that you can invest in that's a sure win, it's in the church. I mean, there is nothing that could defeat it. No nuclear uh, war or anything like that could ever defeat the church. I mean, that's the thing that you get to be part of, amen? I mean, that's what we, I get a little bit excited about that. It's like, man, there's nothing, nothing in this planet that could prevent the church from being the tangible presence of God. See, that's what the whole point is. And Jesus is saying, listen, man, if there's anything you should invest in, right there it is. Right there is invest in the church. Be a part of that church family, and you will find that it will be the tangible presence of God in your life. Well, listen, there are moments in your life where you're going to need that. And you know what? As a pastor, I've been with a lot of people. I'll get a phone call, in my, you know, and all of a sudden they're like, listen, I need your help. And they have no church family to be a part of. Or there's no church family in, in, in their story. And I wonder sometimes, it's like, when you're going through things, who do you turn to? Sometimes we don't want people to know, but man, we need people to know. We need the church to come around us and maybe uh, be that support and that restoration that we absolutely need. And there was a moment in 2005 when I realized how important the church family was for me. I was a pastor for nine years, and you would think that I would understand this. But understand, listen, you don't really know how really important the church family becomes until you go through a real tough time. I mean, your family's really good, but when you have your church family, man, when you have the tangible presence of God around you, it's a whole, it takes it to a whole nother level. 
And in January of 2005, I remember I was thinking, I was preaching, I was, oh, I was going to be preaching, I was sitting in the front row, and, and, and the band was up there playing and singing, and, and I remember in, in a moment, all of a sudden, um, like, I like was sweating profusely, I was like, uh, I was about to pass out, and, and I just wanted to lose my breakfast, you know, it was like, I was like in a bad shape in a bad way. I was like, what is going on? So while they were singing, I stepped out. I went downstairs to the kitchen, and they were kind of doing some stuff in the kitchen. I said, hey, do you have anything I can eat? I, I'm not feeling too well. And I said, listen, could you, could you help me with? And they were like, yeah, here's a couple of apple slices. And I munched on those, and I was just like, I was like, man, I just feel exhausted. And I really did. I felt like I had gone like 12 rounds. Do you guys know who Mike Tyson is? Some of you maybe know who he is. I felt like I went 12 rounds with Mike Tyson. And I was like, man, i got to get up and preach, but I just feel exhausted. And I was like, man, my weight, legs were wobbly getting up out of the stage. And I remember making it through that, that morning and preaching, and I was like, that was kind of weird. So all week, that last, the next week, I was kind of like, um, what was that all about? Just couldn't figure it out. And, and then all of a sudden, um, the next weekend came in, and, and it was that night, Saturday night, and I remember going to bed. And every time I closed my eyes, there were like these fireworks going off in my head. Like literally, my eyes, it's like in my eyelids, I could see fireworks. And I was going, what is that all about? And I just could not sleep a wink that night. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? I mean, this is just really weird. I've never experienced this before. Um, I mean, you all know that I'm like, uh, I'm, I'm like the top physical specimen of mankind. And I mean, I'm like, what is this? Where, where is this coming from? So I'm just kind of, so I called my associate pastor. I said, uh, I said hey, uh, you, you're going to have to preach for me. I'm exhausted. I don't know what's going on, um, and, but I'm not going to be able to make it in today. He said, oh, absolutely no problem. So um, while he was, they were in church, I uh, called my, uh, my friend who's a doctor, family doctor in our church. I said, hey, after church, can you stop by? And he's like, absolutely. And so I was thinking, well, I need to get ready. I, I want to look presentable for him. And, um, and so don't worry, uh, it's not a TMI moment. But, but I was in the shower, and I remember while I was standing there, I reached for the soap, and I just bawled like a baby. And I was like, now, you all know, I mean, like, I can't even squeeze out tears. It's really hard for me. Like, I'm not a crier. That's my wife. I mean, it takes, now, when a guy cries, man, you, you, you get me, all right? It's like, I start to just, whoa, like, that's a lot when a guy starts to cry. But I'm not a crier. It's like, you know, but, but in the shower, right in there, and I thought, man, this is for my pride. It's like, listen, you know, Tiffany will see me, but she'll think it was just the, the water from the shower. But I was just bawling like a baby, and I'm like, what is wrong with me? what is wrong with me? And I got dressed and got ready and he came over and he, I talked with this friend of ours and I said, hey, listen, I don't know what's going on. And he's like, listen to me. And he goes, listen, um, Rustin, there's nothing physically wrong that I can see, but you need to go see your family doctor and, 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 and talk with him about that. And I was like, man, really? Okay. And so I got a, an appointment that next week and saw my family doctor and my family doctor looked at me and he's a Christian, good, good Christian guy. And he said, hey, Rus listen, Rustin, there's nothing wrong with you physically, but, but there's something going on with you emotionally. And I'm like, emotionally? I'm like, what are emotions? I don't even know what those are. I'm a guy, right? And so I don't even know what those are. And he's like, but you, you need to go see this Christian counselor. And I'm like, Christian, no, I don't need to go see a counselor. I'm a pastor. I, I, I'll, just, I'll just do this for myself, right? Hey, Rustin, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing okay. You know, it's just, I'll, I'll talk to myself. And, and I remember calling the guy and, and uh, I, got, I got an appointment set up and, and, and then I found out the price and I was like, 95 bucks, are you kidding me? And uh, no, no offense to counselors or anything like that. Um, but I tell the people, when I do counseling, I tell people, hey, listen, I'm free. So you get what you pay for, all right? And um, anyways, so I sat down with him and, uh, and he pretty much diagnosed me pretty quick. And he said, Rustin, you're a, you're a really angry guy. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, oh, just kidding. So I punched him in the nose and all this stuff. And I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. And he goes, no, you really, seriously. And he, we started talking. And he, he's like, listen, you got a lot of anger in your past. You got a lot of anger in your present and um, all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and I started thinking about it. And he goes, Rustin, I'm just going to tell you right now, um, all that anger is killing you. All that anger is killing you. And until you deal with that anger, your body is going to continue to shut down. And can I just pause right here as a pastor and tell you, listen, if you are carrying anger and you haven't broken down yet, it's only a matter of time. 
God is whistling, right? It's only a matter of time before your body starts rebelling against you, saying, there is a problem. Houston, we have a problem. And I remember thinking, oh, this is terrible. And um, so I said, what do I do? And he said, well, you need to pray, and you need to start getting this stuff out to God and all this kind of stuff. And so I started doing that, and I remember uh, about for two weeks, they put me on Ambien, and, and, um, and they said, listen, you're not sleeping. I said, I'm not sleeping, and I don't know what's wrong with me. And he said, just, just take some Ambien. That'll help you get some sleep. But listen, you, you need to go for some long walks, and you need to get this anger out. Well, some of this anger has to do with people that, uh, well, maybe they don't even know they did anything wrong, or maybe they don't care, whatnot. And he goes, that doesn't matter. you got to get it out. you you got to just... Release this and say, God, this is now on you, not me. And I remember doing that for two weeks, and I just remember, God, where are you? God, where are you? And I just felt like, have you ever felt like that in a moment? Like you're like, God, where are you? It's like my purse feel like they're hitting the ceiling and kind of like, God, where are you? And, and uh, I remember it was during that time my counselor said, hey, listen, um, I, I only went to him for about, about uh, six weeks. And because um, then I was broke, you know, at that point. But... Uh, <laughs> I was like, um, he said about halfway through, he said, listen, you, it might be a good idea for you to, to tell the church. And I was like, tell the church? What are you talking about? And I'm like, no way. If they heard that I'm like weak this way, they'll be like, totally like, why did we hire that guy? He's such a loser and all this kind of stuff. And, and I'm like, I, I, can't, I can't do that. And uh, I mean, you got to understand, at that point, th- this is how I would come up to preach. I, every week I would come up to preach and I'd have to sit on a stool just to preach. My legs felt like jello, and I was like, I was just like knocked out. That's what anger does to you. That's what it really does. Physically, that's how it affects you. And I remember, I'm like a caged animal up here. I mean, you guys don't know me, and it's kind of like, man, I, it was hard. And, I was, and, and people were wondering, they're like, something's up, man. Something's up. We understand. We know what's going on. They'd ask me the question, how you doing? I'd say, I'm fine. <laughs> there you go. You said it before. I'm fine, and you know I'm not fine. But you're not talking, and we don't know, and so we'll just go with what you say. And so I'm sitting there going, um, no way can I tell the church. And I talked to my doctor friend that's a friend in our church, and, and I tell him what the counselor said, and I said, I said uh, hey, um, this is what he says, and I, he thinks I should tell the church. Like, really? Like, he thinks I should, like, bear my soul to the church. And he said, my doctor friend looked at me and goes, I think he's right. I'm like, are you kidding me? So I punched him in the nose. I was like, dude, what's wrong with you, man? And no, I didn't. For those of you that are going to email me later, I did not do that. And then I looked at my wife, and, and my wife said, I think you should. I think you should. I said, no, I don't think so. I don't think so. So the next Sunday, I was up there preaching and, and talking, and it's, you ever feel that just like God's, there's like a weight on your shoulder, you're like, Man, I can't even keep moving until I just deal with this. And so I said, fine. They're all like, what well, fine? What well, fine? Well, what's wrong? And I said, listen, fine. Um, you need to know what's going on. So you're all freaking out while I'm sitting on a stool and, and all this stuff. And, and, uh, and, and I, I said, let me tell you what's going on. So I told him the story. And I was just waiting for the humiliation, the ridicule, and all this kind of stuff. And I remember after the service, I was standing up front, and some people came up and said, hey, don't you go away. Don't you go away. And they came up, and and they put their arms around me and they said, uh, hey, I've been there. And I'll tell you something. These were guys that came up to me that, that weekend. I'm sure there's women that have been there too, but there were guys that came up and said, uh, that took a lot of guts for you to say, I know. We know you. <laughs> you know, your pride is really thick. And, uh, and I remember I was telling them, I said, listen, I feel like I'm about to pass out every time I come to church and every time I get up to preach. And... and um, I said, I just, I can't keep going this route. Anyways, so um, I remember church attendance went up because everybody couldn't wait to see if the pastor was going to pass out every time he preached. <laughs> so I thought that was a good news. I mean, hey, that's build the church one way or another, you know, <laughs> have babies or pass out one or the other. And, uh, and so I just remember, it's like, um, I told him in that week, it was like, uh, it just didn't go the way I thought it would go. People just put their arms around me. And, uh, and I was like, I just, I can't believe that. And it was in that moment um, that I realized how important the church was. I really did. 
And I thought, where would I be today without those people in my life? And, and I wonder if you've been there too. Maybe you've had those moments where you're like, where would I be without my church family? See, the church family is meant to be that tangible presence of God in our midst. When we're like, God, where are you? I think God would whisper, go to church. Because the, the church is meant to be the tangible presence of God. Because he's intangible. And Peter felt this. Peter got this in a hurry in Acts chapter 12. So I want you to turn there. Uh, in Acts chapter 12, I want you to notice this. And uh, while you're turning there, some of you, well, did, did you ever like overcome all that stuff? Um, I did, but I kind of feel scarred after it all. And there are moments where before I get up here, my legs, legs get a little bit wobbly. And so uh, don't worry, it's not going to happen now. We're okay. So you're all excited. This is it going to happen? People are eating popcorn. It's crazy. It was awesome. <laughs> So uh, chapter 12 of verse 1, this is where it says, as it was about this time that King Herod, now King Herod, the Herod is, is like the, the, the ruling family, actually it was Agrippa the first, but they call him the Herods, and um, they arrested some who belonged to who? Who belonged to why? The church. It's like, oh no, intending to persecute them. They, you know, and, and it says, he had James, the, the brother of John, these are the two guys, the, the, the brothers of, the, of Zebedee, and Jesus found them fishing, and, and he said, hey guys, follow me, and they dropped their nets and did what? They followed him, right? And uh, it's, it's James, and uh, it said he put James to death with a sword. I mean, literally, I mean, they're going to cut his head off. And when he saw, when Herod saw that this pleased the Jews, can you imagine? That's disgusting. This pleased them. Oh, yeah. It's like, are you kidding me? This pleased the Jews. It said he proceeded to seize Peter. Grab that guy. Grab that guy. You know, it's like, whoa. So Peter's snagged, and it said, um, he goes on to say, it said, this happened during the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which the Feast of Unleavened Bread is during the Passover, and during, the Passover is all about the, uh, remember in Exodus, where was the, the, the spirit of death was going to come by, and if, if you didn't have the blood of the lamb over the doorpost, that, that, that your, your firstborns would be, would be killed, and and so that was a, a night of deliverance uh, through the blood of the Lamb. And so for him, here's this moment. Little does Peter know that God is about to show some great deliverance. Um, but after arresting him, verse 4, uh, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. So here you've got all these guys for Peter, for Peter. I mean, you can almost imagine Herod's like, listen, I don't need some jailbreak. I don't need, I don't need somebody busting in and getting him out. I want to make sure that he's ready to go for when the Passover's over, we're going to kill this man in front of everybody because he, it was, it was like Herod was becoming a rock star with the people because he was killing these Christians. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was doing what? Where's the church at this? So the church is earnestly praying to God for him. Now the word earnestly in the Greek literally means like these people are stretched out, like they're giving it all they've got. They're like the RPMs are a redlining. I mean like they're giving everything they can. God, please. I mean they're like prostrated before God. They're laying on the ground. Whatever it takes, God, we're praying for our brother Peter because they know he's going to jail and that means it's a death sentence. He's going to be killed. So while Peter is in prison, while Peter's in jail, thinking about, hey, listen, my life is about to come to an end, and God, where are you? The church is on this side going, we know about it, and we're praying for you. The night before Herod was about to bring him to trial, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and sentries stood guard at the entrance. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. He said he struck Peter on the side and woke him up. Quick, get up, he said, and the chains fell off Peter's wrists. Then the angel said to him, put on your clothes and your sandals, dude, get dressed. And Peter did so and wrapped his cloak around him, and he said, follow me. And, the angel told, uh, and Peter followed him out of the prison, but he had no idea what the angel was doing was really happening. He just thought he was seeing a vision. I mean, he'd experienced visions before. He thought, oh man, this is like I'm half awake. This can't be real. I must be dreaming that this is happening. They passed the first and second guards and came to the iron gate leading to the city, and it opened for them by itself, kind of like the Star Trek, whoosh. It maybe even had the whoosh sound. I don't know if it did, but just let's believe it did, Okay. Okay? 
Okay, thank you. Whoosh, you know, and, and, then, and then so he passes right through. They pass it the first sec, and then uh, it opened by itself, and they went through it, and when they walked through the length of one street, suddenly the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, now I know without a doubt that the Lord sent his angel, and he rescued me from Herod's clutches and from everything the Jewish people were anticipating. See, when you're in a tough situation, you're wondering, where are you, God? Now, where are you, God? And uh, God seems to want to, it's like the, the, the mission objective, the job description for God is that he wants to show you his presence and his power. I mean, he does. If you've read anything about the Bible, God wants you to know that no matter what you go through, no matter what you face, he wants to play peekaboo. He wants you to see that he's there. I mean, just take, there's a couple of guys in the book of Daniel. That's a great book if you haven't read it. Uh, by chance, but read it because there's these guys and they say, hey, listen, bow to this statue when the sound is uh, played. And they're like, no. And he says, if you don't, you're going to be thrown in the fire. They don't, they're thrown in the fire. And, and, and uh, the king says, hey, listen, I threw three guys into the fire, right? I mean, I threw three guys. Yeah. Then why are there four guys in there? See, the story goes that God's right there in the midst of the fire. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the fire is where they see God. God's saying, listen, it's okay. It's like, I'm here. I'm walking this path with you. You are not alone. See, God wants, no matter what you're going through, he wants to show you his presence and his power. I think that's why David says in Psalm 23, I've used it often because it's a refreshment to my soul. Hopefully it is to you, where he says, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of what? Yeah, he doesn't say of plenty, of prosperity, it's the shadow of death. When you're going through the tough times of life, I want you to know, he says, I fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Some of you have been wondering, you're going through something in your marriage, you're going through something with your kids, or maybe you're going through something with your health, and you're like, God, where are you? God, where are you? I'm looking for you. See, you got to understand, God is with you, and God wants you to see his presence and his power. And for Peter, he's wondering, God, I'm, I've got a death sentence. I'm about to be killed. Where are you? And God delivers him and to, to kind of do this miraculous thing to show and confirm that his, his faith that God is with him. But, God, but something happens. Okay, so there's this always desire of looking for God, but sometimes it doesn't come up so easily like that. Sometimes we're still looking and saying, God, where are you? And I'm sifting through all of this stuff, and I just can't seem to grab a hold of you. Where are you? This is where I think the church comes into play. Then it says this. Look at verse 12. It says, when he, this had dawned on him, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had what? The church had gathered, and they were praying. They were praying for Peter. See, this is the thing. So Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer the door. And when she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. I love that. Peter's knocking on the door, and she's like, it's Peter. She runs away. Uh, hello? <laughs> like, seriously? Like, where are you? And they're all going, no, you're out of your mind. I mean, see, he, these guys are praying for Peter's, like, a miraculous situation to happen. They're praying for something like this to happen. God protect, God save, God rescue. And uh, when God answers, sometimes we're kind of like, you're out of your mind. That didn't really happen, did it? And she kept insisting. And they said, no, it must be his angel. So they must have gone with her at that point, said, all right, all right, she won't stop talking, let's go. But Peter, while she's in there talking, Peter's just knocking. At some point, they're going to come to the door, right? So here's Peter knocking, and when they opened the door, they saw him, and they were what? They were astonished. See, while they're praying, they get to see what God is doing in his life. Now they're praising. See, it moves from praying to praising, and it's like, it's like oh my word, I, I, and they just all of a sudden start praising God, saying hallelujah, amen, whatever it is. We're just like lifting up the name of Jesus right now, because God did something great, and God did something uh, amazing. But Peter kept, or, or sorry, and then Peter, look at verse 17. Peter motioned with his, uh, with his hand for them to be quiet, and he described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. All of a sudden, the church who's praying for him is now praising God for him and what God had done in this brother's life. And then he says this, this last thing, and I want you to notice it. He says, tell James. Now, James the half-brother, the, the brother of John, he's not talking about him. This is the half-brother of Jesus. 
tell James and the brothers about this. And I think what he's saying here is this. The church is the tangible presence of God. And they get to pray for you. And when you're going through tough times, you get to run to them. And they can pray for you. And while they're praying for you, they can see what God's doing in your life. And they can, they can praise God with whatever he is doing in your life. And they can see how God is doing great and glorious things in our midst. And then when we get to tell each other our story. See, we get to, we get to brag on God. We get to brag on God. Not on us, not on our ability, not on our strength, because we're weak, and He is strong. See, God uses our story for His glory. That's what He does. That's what He wants to do. And you become an inspiration to the people around you to hang on, to hold tight, and just rest in Him knowing, I don't, can't make sense of all this, I don't know what's going on, and I'm wondering, God, where are you? And He whispers, go to the church, and I go to the church, and I tell them what's going on, and they put their arms around me, they become the tangible presence of God, and I get to tell them what's going on, they're going to pray for me, and we're going to pray and pray and pray, and we're going to pray some more, and we're going to watch God do what God wants to do. And like Paul says in Romans 8, he says, listen, God God works together, um, all things together for what? For good, for those who love him and are called called according to his purpose. I don't know what God wants to do in your situation, but all I know is he is good and he wants to do good. He wants to show you his presence and his power. He wants you to know that no matter where you go, no matter what you face, no, no matter how deep it may go or how high it gets, that God is walking with you. And he's given the church a tangible presence, a tangible expression of the presence of God, the intangible presence of God. He's saying, go to church, be a part of the family. And I love this. If, if you don't get get it. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 18, verse 20. We kind of slip right through this, but I want you to see this. He says, for where two or three come together, again, that are gathering together, what does he say? In my name, there I am with who? With them. See, what he's saying is the church is the tangible presence of the intangible God. It's like you get to come and you get to see God at work. You get to see what God's doing in each other's lives. You get to pray for each other. You get to restore each other. You get to forgive each other. You get to help each other take those next steps and say, listen, no matter what you're going through, brother, no matter what you're going through, sister, we've got a hopeful God, a faithful God who can see us through. And we're going to pray for you until it does, until it happens. We're not going to give up on you. We're going to stand beside you no matter where you go. Because when the church comes together, there he is in their midst. And as a pastor, I can't help but think, why would you want to miss that? Seriously, why would you want to miss that? There are people in our community. I remember when I first got here, uh, (laughs) I'm having up three. Um, And I remember saying, when I first got here, I said, God, if I could be a pastor to every family in our county, That'd be awesome. Because I know that there are families in this, com- this community that don't have a church family to hold on to. And they're, they're in their house because they're dealing with their family, they're dealing with their marriage, and they're dealing with their kids, they're dealing with a health issue, or they're dealing with a loss of job, and they're going, who do I turn to? Who do I turn to? And I'll tell you something. I know who they turn to. Because all of a sudden... They're calling Brighton Chapel saying, I need help. Now, we're bees, you know, so when you're in the alphabet looking for churches, we get to be one of the first churches people call. And I'm okay with that. Because where two or three are gathered, there I am in their midst. And they're going, I need the presence of an intangible God. I need him tangible. And they don't, they're looking for it because they need it. And so do you, and so do I. That's why it's so important to be a part of a church family. That we get to stand beside each other as one of our life application, and that we get to stand and share life with each other and say, you're not alone. Even when life is, is like going the way we don't want it to go, We can be there with each other and say, I'll put my arms around you and I'll let you know that there is a loving God who loves you. Don't give up on him. I needed that and I realized how vitally important the church is. 
So that's why it's really important for me. It's like when we have moments where we share things with the church, it's like when there's honesty and stuff like this and stuff going on, and we restore and encourage and pray and lift each other up, man, that's why the church is so amazing because we get to be the tangible presence of God on this planet. And there is nothing, Jesus says, nothing, not even the gates of hell that can stop that. That's what I want to be a part of. And I want every family to be a part of that. And I hope that you'll get it in ink and be a part of this family. I want you to pray for the, mo- for the next few moments. I want you to stand. We've got some couples that are going to come and pray. Listen, while you're standing, I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're going through. Maybe some of you are like, listen, I've got some stuff going on in my life. These folks want to come and they want to be the tangible presence of God in your life. They want to pray for you. They want to put their arms around you. I'm not a hugger, so, you know, um, I may put my hand on his shoulder, you know? Sometimes you catch me right, I'll hug. And uh, some of you are like, I'm not a hugger or whatever. Just, but they want to just, they just want to let you know that you matter and that God loves you. They just want to put their arms around you if you let them. And they just want to pray for you. That's why they're here. That's why they're here, to be the tangible experience of an intangible God. They want to do that for you. So you come. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this opportunity to be here. Thank you that we get to to be a part of a family, a fellowship that supports and cares and loves us. That God, when we're going through some really hard times, and some of us in this room are really going through some stuff that's really hard. Some of us are going through some stuff in our marriages. Some of us are going through some stuff with, with our kids. Some of us are going through some stuff with our jobs or maybe it's our health. Whatever it is, God, we're going through some stuff. And being able to just kind of verbalize that with a brother and a sister and just say, hey, can you pray for me? It's in those moments that we just experience your presence in a powerful way. Because God, we need you desperately. And I pray, Lord, that everyone in this room, first service, this service, would know how important each person is and why this church family can be an amazing gift to each other from your hands. And so, God, I pray for all those that are outside of our community that they would find this place, a place where they can call home and say, man, what a, where, how have I missed this for so long? This is exactly what I need. And God, we pray that you would help us to be that loving, support, supportive, and encouraging network in this really difficult time that we live. We need you, and we're looking for you. And we pray that together we put our arms around each other and wait for your arrival. And that one day when you come, we're just going to celebrate and say, it's time to go home. We love you. We give you glory and honor and praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. God bless you. Have a great day. And I'll see you soon.